There's a look at the weather around the Western Hemisphere this afternoon. We're just over two weeks from the fall equinox. That's when the days and the nights are of equal length and the sun's track moves into the Southern Hemisphere and we begin that slow slide into winter. Now this was expected to be a very active hurricane season. We're certainly not seeing that. Things are fairly quiet out in the Atlantic. You can see the probability formation, 20%, 10%, 20%, 30%. This is probably going to be the best shot coming in for this weekend and early next week. The Yucatan, the Bay of Campeche. Let's take a look at the integrated vapor transport for the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. This is one of my favorite charts for bringing out these easterly waves as they head towards the west. And this one moves into Belize, the Yucatan, and kind of crosses over right there into the Bay of Campeche. Not really much development. This is going to be Sunday. Then we go into Monday and Tuesday, just kind of unsettled in that area. A couple of other waves move in from the Atlantic, but we're just not seeing very much. Most of the activity is going to be in the form of extra tropical lows along this stationary front through Florida, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Gulf Stream. We do have some very significant weather ongoing in the South China Sea. We've got Typhoon Yagi just northwest of the Philippines moving westward. And you can see that the peak strength in about 24 hours is 135 knots. Here in the Atlantic, that would be a category, in fact, a high-end Category 4 storm, almost Category 5. And then that weakens to 110 knots. That would be in the Cat 3 range as it approaches Hainan Island, the Straits, and this little peninsula right there. This is mountainous terrain. There could be potential for some significant flooding, landslides, and power outages. Here's some graphics showing the storm. Now the times at the bottom, those are going to be U.S. times. You'll have to add about 12 hours to get local time here. But this is going to be near peak intensity. A little bit of weakening as it approaches the coast. The frictional effects tearing up the storm. And then it moves inland. And here's a look at the wind field. Rather expansive as we get into Thursday and Friday. So there will be damage up and down the coast. And then it moves inland. You can see pretty much the stronger effects are going to be in northern Hainan Island and on up the coast, maybe about 100 to 150 miles. Here's a look at about nine hours of satellite imagery. The infrared images show a well-defined eye and a rather symmetric eye wall. And the uh, Dvorak satellite enhancement does show characteristics of a stronger tropical cyclone. So let's take a look at the weather in the lower 48. This weather pattern looks very typical of early fall, maybe October. We've got a large anticyclone across the eastern U.S. Look at those dew points. They're in the 40s and 50s and lower 60s. So that is dry air that has come out of Canada and has modified and picked up a little thermal energy on the way down. In the Gulf Coast region, stationary front, and that will be hanging around for at least a few days, producing extensive rain across the Gulf Coast area. Look at these one-week rainfall totals. These orangish colors, those are going to be anywhere from 5 up to 15 inches, extending from the western Gulf across the Florida Panhandle and out into the Gulf Stream region. Fortunately, not much extent inland. However, parts of Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, they will be seeing about 2 to 5 inches. A quick check of weather around the country. If you look carefully in the northeastern U.S., you can see a little bit of wildfire smoke, which has come down out of Canada. Lots of wildfires going on up there in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Northwest Territories, and that's made its way down. No real weather problems. However, there are small craft advisories from Long Island down through New Jersey and into Virginia. They do have a beach hazard statement for Virginia in this area right here due to breaking waves four to five feet with onshore swell and an enhanced risk of rip currents. In the southeastern U.S., we get into some stormy weather. Yet another day of thunderstorms across Florida. 
We do have that small craft advisory extending all the way down into northern Florida and out into the western part of Florida as well. There will be northeast winds 10 to 20 knots with seas running 5 to 8 feet. There is a heat advisory this afternoon for southeastern Florida, including Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Heat indexes will be 105 to 110. As we go west, we pick up flood watches. Those start in coastal Mississippi and extend into southern Louisiana. That includes Gulfport, New Orleans, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, and Lake Charles. Those extend through Friday, and we're looking at totals as high as 5 to 10 inches along the coastal regions. Looking at the weather in Texas, we're very, very slowly starting to get rid of the rain. Some lingering showers hanging around from Louisiana out to Dallas and into the Hill Country, but that will start clearing out over the next couple of days. However, going into Tuesday and Wednesday, the lower Rio Grande Valley will be picking up some heavy rains. So we will watch for that. In the Northern Plains, a marginal risk of severe thunderstorms from Minnesota into Western Nebraska. Let's take a closer look at that. It's a little bit hard to see, but that's gonna be that green area, marginal risk from the Storm Prediction Center. The risk within that is gonna be for isolated, high winds and large hail. Already got a few thunderstorms going around chug water down into Cheyenne and other storms in the higher terrain in northern Colorado. In the southwestern U.S., a reduction in monsoon activity, mostly confined to the higher elevations. Now we are also getting to a heat wave. These are the current mid-afternoon temperatures, 106 at Phoenix, 110 at Yuma, and 113 at Thermal. We have an extensive excessive heat warning. This covers all of the lower deserts from Tucson and Phoenix up to Las Vegas and into the Mojave Desert. Also some coverage all the way to the coasts. We're looking for temperatures 95 to 100 in the Los Angeles and San Diego area with 110 to 120 in the interior deserts. There's a look at the high temperatures this afternoon, 111 at Phoenix, 106 at Las Vegas. Tomorrow will be the big peak of the heat wave in the lower deserts, 114 at Phoenix, 114 at Needles. And then Friday, it's going to be particularly bad there in Los Angeles, looking for 100 at downtown, 111 at Riverside, hundreds all through the foothills of San Diego, and 100s into the San Joaquin Valley, 105 there at Fresno. In the northwestern U.S., we also have an excessive heat warning for later in the week around Portland, Salem, and Eugene. Very large heat advisory across much of the interior, and we've got red flag warnings in effect for the Cascades in Washington and the coastal mountains. As far as temperatures, this afternoon, 96 at Portland, 102 at Medford. Then for Thursday, we're looking for a high of 102 at Portland, 105 at Medford. This is going to be the hottest day in the western regions. Then for Friday, looking for a high of 100 at Portland, so that's a little bit better, but 95 at Spokane and continued hot across much of the region going into Saturday. Sorry about these missing tiles. I do see that a lot on this digital.weather.gov website. I think they've got that on a bad server. So that is what's happening in the lower 48. We head out to the Pacific and into Alaska. Stormy once again in the Gulf of Alaska. Gale warnings in effect. And we have an atmospheric river slinging moisture into southeastern Alaska and the southern coast. Deep southerly flow in place, and that means downslope winds on the north side of the Alaska range. We do have a wind advisory Thursday on the north slopes of the Alaska Range from Denali National Park to Healy and Fort Greeley. Winds could gust to 60 miles an hour there. You can see a little bit of that lee side troughing in that same region. In Canada, looks like it's quieting down with this large anti-cyclone across British Columbia and Alberta. We do have continued air quality advisories for wildfire smoke from Saskatchewan into Manitoba. Along this frontal system in western Ontario, we have severe thunderstorm watches and warnings. The warnings are in effect around Pickle Lake, 
northward due to strong wind gusts and a little bit of large hail. Wind warning in northern Quebec from Quoctaw up the coast for 55 mile hour winds on Thursday as that low pushes to the east. And in Newfoundland, we've got our very first frost advisories for central Newfoundland. That includes a wide area west of Gander to Cornerbrook. So let's examine the upper level charts and see what's going on. This is at 500 millibars, about 3 kilometers, about 18,000 feet. We see a couple of subtropical highs, one across the Mojave Desert, another one around Portland. And of course, that's where we have the heat wave developing. We've got another anticyclone across the Midwest. And there's kind of a unsettled pattern, kind of a very broad ridge with a little bit of northerly flow down into the Gulf of Mexico. And there we pick up a couple of disturbances, one little low around Houston. And then looking up north, a large area of prevailing westerlies broken up into ridges, one in the British Columbia region, another one over Quebec, and of course the troughs in between, one across the Canadian prairies and the other in the Gulf of Alaska. That one supporting that storm out there in the Gulf of Alaska. Let's take a look at the conditions over the next several days into late next week. And we see it's rather progressive. This ridge pushes from British Columbia into the prairies. This low advances into the Great Lakes area, bringing cool air. We're looking for some rather cool conditions, maybe some frost advisories over the weekend in parts of Wisconsin and Minnesota. There will be widespread 40s for overnight lows late this weekend across the Midwest and 50s all the way down to Alabama, even down to Texas. So that'll be something to look forward to. So we go into Saturday and Sunday, things push along. This occlusion lifts northeastward. We get this ridge building in the plains, which will warm things up in that part of the country, and a very large trough off the west coast. Then at the very end of the period, going into Tuesday and Wednesday, very stormy on the west coast. A polar front jet going right into northern California. So this is going to mark a return to some cool season type weather patterns in that part of the country. Yeah, look at that strong polar front jet. So this will definitely gear things up later next week for some interesting weather in the West Coast region. This upper level high settles back in across West Texas. So a bit of a warm up across that part of the Southwest. Now, looking at all this weather that we talked about, it does somewhat resemble an El Nino pattern. Warm conditions out in the western coastal regions, wet down south, cool along the Gulf Coast, and a rather strong storm track bringing that system that we talked about for next week into California. However, checking the current forecast for El Nino, we are actually looking for La Nina going into the fall and winter. There's a graph of how things are expected to gear up. The blue colors are going to be La Nina and going into August, September, October, November, and into the depths of winter. Very high likelihood of La Nina patterns. And this is the archetype of typical weather in a La Nina season. Strong northwesterly flow. And that could spell cold weather, at least for the northern plains. It really depends on the particular kinds of weather patterns we have, weather that makes it into the southern part of the U.S. Generally looking for dry weather in that part of the country, wet and warm out in the eastern U.S. And you can see the tendency towards troughing out around the Hudson Bay region. This is another interesting map of La Nina archetypes. Very similar to the last map, but it shows a little bit more detail. So pick out your favorite area, and that might be what you're going to be having this winter. Here's a look at the mid-winter temperature anomalies during a La Nina episode, December, January, February. That's what that DJF means. Definitely looking at below normal conditions along the northern tier states and much of the Midwest. Precipitation does show dry in the Gulf Coast region into Texas, and then it increases as you go north. So colder and wetter conditions, what does that mean? 
Yes, a lot of snow. So the northwestern U.S. looking for a good possibility of heavy snow all the way into the Colorado Rockies. And of course, this is not an absolute forecast. A lot of times during La Nina, we get lots of snow all the way in, into the central U.S. So really, the day-to-day -day weather depends what kind of patterns are superimposed on top of the La Nina pattern. Again, the La Nina patterns are not what we have all the time during the winter, but it represents the most common type of setup we see on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is the part of the show where I have to pass the hat and hope we have generous viewers who will give something back. If we get more of that Patreon support, I can put some of my other projects aside and start expanding this one maybe into a daily show or at least add on one or two more days per week. So please consider that. And if it appeals to you, head over to Patreon. There is our link. Anyway, hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday and Thursday, and we'll see you back here on the Friday show. Take care. Bye-bye.